Last time, or last video, we talked about theoretical probability, and we left off with just finding the uh, theoretical probability from a standard deck of cards. The probability of picking a three out of a standard deck of cards, we had to first find out how many cards there were, the sample space. There are 52 cards in the sample space, 52 cards. There they all are. How many of them are the number three? Well, it doesn't matter what color they are. We just need them to have a number three. So that's four out of 52, which we reduce to 1 13th, which we could convert to a decimal, which we could then convert to a percent by moving that decimal over twice. So about 7.6%, you know, which is less than 10% of the time, less than one out of every 10. Well, we knew that because it's one out of every 13. That's what we would approximately use to expect or the degree of likelihood we have of picking a three from a random deck of cards, okay? What we wanna talk about now today is something called um, more like sample space problems, but also we're gonna get back into that theoretical probability um, and how we can build off of that. But here's an old problem from a college professor. I don't know why I remember it, I just do. So I'll substitute his name with mine. Mr. Kirsch has the following articles clothing uh, to choose from. Three different shirts, a white, a blue, and a striped one, two ties, a blue and a red one, three pairs of pants, khaki, gray, and blue, uh, pairs of pants and how many different combinations of outfits do I now have? So that means if I mix and match things, you know, you can start to think like one pair would be, or one outfit would be a white shirt, blue tie, khaki pants. Um, you might think like a, a white shirt, red tie, khaki pants, or maybe a white shirt, blue tie, gray pants. And you can see I've made a bunch of different combinations just by changing, you know, what kind of ties and pants I have, but not even the shirts. So what you could do is you could make a tree diagram from a white, blue, and striped shirt. Each one of them I could pair with any tie I want. Blue or red, blue or red, and then blue or red. Maybe I should have used black ink here so that the blue and red, well, whatever. And then from each one of those combinations, so from a white shirt and a blue tie and a white shirt and a red tie, I can change what kind of pants I wear too. So this gives us already six different options just from that white shirt, right? White, blue tie, khaki, white, blue tie, gray, white, blue tie, blue, white, red tie, khaki, white, red tie, gray, white, red tie. And, oh, I meant to put a blue in there. There. Okay, and we can just kind of continue this process for each, and forgive me for writing so small, for each combination of clothing for each outfit. And then if I wanted to think, okay, what are all the different combinations of outfits that I have? Okay, I can just look down the list, one, two, three, right? Two, three, four. And basically what I'm doing is just counting this bottom row, right? If I just count this bottom row, that's gonna give me all of the different outfits. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 different outfits. Well, the reason why that gets to 18 different outfits is because I started with three options. And then off of those three options, I had two more options. And off of those two options, I had three more options. So essentially what we're doing is we're just kind of counting up and using multiplication. Three times two is six and six times this three is 18 different outfits. So if you wanted to stamp your understanding here to find a, a sample space with all of these different combinations, all you have to do is basically multiply the different possibilities. That's gonna give us kind of our total amount of possibilities. So once again, three times two, times three gives us 18. And if you don't want to, if you can't believe me, you can actually start listing those off, right? WBK, WBG, WBB, right? So on and so forth, all the way down the line. But that's how I would really quickly create a sample space or a total different number of combinations um, from several things. Why this is useful is because we now start talking about, um, let's start talking about picking up ping pong balls from a bag. So a bag contains four ping pong balls. Two are red, one is green, and one is blue. And we're gonna find the total number of possibilities from two draws. So think about um, how would I find how many different um, ways we could do this. So let's just, just create a tree diagram as we would before. Uh, we have two red, so an R, we'll call that R1 and R2 for like the first red and the second red. 
and we have a green and we have a blue. And of those, so this is like my first draw, first ping pong ball, I have four different options. And remember that what we are now talking about is putting that thing back. So what we're talking about here is actually two different events. So instead of just picking one out of the bag, I got to pick it out, put it back in, and then pick another. So there's a possibility that I pick the same exact item twice, like the first red one and the first red one. Or I could pick that first red one and the other red one. Or I could pick the first red one and a green, first red one and a blue. And we can see that this repeats itself for every single one of these options. I could pick the other red one first and then the first red one next, or the same red one twice green and blue. Okay, and that happens for every single one of these. Now, I'm not going to list these out for everyone. Yeah, it will. Okay. But now I can see how many, how many different combinations I have, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Well, you may have already been deciding how would I have found that without doing this tree diagram? Well, you had four options to start and then you had another four options after that, right? So what's four times four? That's 16. So we have 16 different possibilities. So remember what we're trying to do here, we're trying to find first the no total number of possibilities from two draws. There's 16 different ways that I can draw two ping pong balls. But now we're gonna find the probability of picking a red two times in a row, and we're gonna use a tree diagram. So let's see, what are the options for me picking a red twice in a row? Well, first thing I could do is I could pick this red, and you can see that I actually have two options there. I could go red one, and then the other red. Or I could pick the other red to start, and then pick either one of the next reds to end there. So it actually looks like I have four different options. I could go red one, red two, red two, red one, uh, R2. R1, 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 R2, R2, R1, R2, R2. And so what we actually have here are four different ways to pick a red two times in a row. So we call that a four sixteenths chance, which of course is one fourth, which reduces to 0.25 or divides to give me 0.25, which is 25%. Now, that is how I would calculate this with a tree diagram. I could actually, once again, find all of the different possibilities and then count up how many different possibilities give me red two times in a row. Now, what we could do instead of doing a tree diagram is we could expedite this process. We do not wanna make a tree diagram every single time we do these. So let's think about how I can do this a little bit quicker. So find the probability of the same exact thing. I'll find the probability of picking a red two times in a row with replacement without the tree diagram. So first of all, here's the way I would think about it. We're doing two separate events, red two times in a row. This is really key, this is uh, very important. So I'm going to rephrase this as a red, then a red. And why this is important, because this helps me to understand that I'm talking about two events happening separately from each other. And I'm going to think about uh, when I see the word then, I'm gonna be thinking about times. So what I really wanna do is the probability of picking a red, and I wanna multiply that times the probability of picking a red. Remember that or, the, number, the word or before actually told us to add? Well, now the number then actually tells us to multiply. We're talking about one, then another. So let's just think about what is the probability of picking a red to start? Well, think about your sample space. How many different options are there? Well, there's two red, one green, that's three, one blue, that's four. So we have a total of four different ping pong balls in there. How many of them are red? Two. So the probability of picking a red to start is two fourths. You could obviously convert that to one half. And since I'm putting it back in, my probability remains the same on the second draw, right? I pick a red, I put it back in. Now I still have a two fourths chance of picking another red. So now, since we're talking about a red, then a red, we can multiply them. Two times two is four, four times four is 16. And we can see that bottom number of 16 coming up again, which we talked about in that tree diagram in that last problem. And I could reduce this to give us, well, one fourth, which we talked about as being 25%. That's what we did on that last problem, but we are doing it differently this time. We are using multiplication in two separate probabilities in order to do so. Why? Because we're talking about an event, then another event. This is what we call compound uh, probability. So now let's use that same kind of concept to find the probability of picking a red, then a green. Keyword here, then. 
that tells me that I'm going to be multiplying two probabilities, the probability of picking a red, and then I'm going to multiply that times the probability of picking a green. So let's find those two probabilities separately and then multiply them together. Probability of picking a red stays the same to start, two-fourths. Now, what about the probability of picking a green? Well, since I'm putting that ping pong ball back in, I still have four chances of picking or four options to pick from a sample space of four. How many of them are green? Let's look back up. It says right here, only one is green. So I have a one fourth chance. And since we're talking about a red, then a green, we need to multiply those two things together. That gives us two sixteenths, which is one eighth chance, which is 0 0.125, which is 12.5%, okay? Which is less likely than picking a red than a red. Well, that makes sense because there's less greens than there are reds. So keyword here, then equals multiply. Make sure that when you see then or the word consecutive or the phrase in a row, all of those things that were, mean that we're talking about something then something else happening these kind of conditional statements okay so let's see what else we have do we have another example of that yes we do we have an, another compound probability example with cards so two cards are picked from a standard deck after the first row the card is put oh is just replaced okay it's put back i think that's where i, I wanted to put uh i had the word put in there we put it back so even after we draw, we have 52 cards to start with. Once we put it back on our second draw, we still have 52. So we're gonna calculate the theoretical probability, the expected, the perfect world situation of the following events, an ace, then an ace. So once again, how many cards do I have to start? 52. How many of them are aces? Only four. Well, that's great. That's the probability of doing just one ace, but we have to do an ace times an ace. Well, if I put it back, there's still gonna be four in there out of 52 cards and I get 16 out of 2,704 different options, which if we reduce that, let me just type that into my calculator. 16 divided by 2704 gives us 0 0.005, about 0 0.059, we'll round that up. But in the meantime, I wanna turn that into a percent. Boom, boom, move it over twice. That's 0.59%. So that's less than 1%. That means it happens less than one out of every 100 times. So a very, very, very low probability. Well, in comparison to some of those other probabilities we've talked about. All right, I don't want you to look at 0.59 and think 50%. It was 0 0.0059. It got turned into 0.5%. That is less than 1%. Okay, so let's talk about the probability of picking a club than a club. Once again, the word then tells me I'm gonna multiply. So let's find out how many clubs we have. There are 13 out of 52. And so if I do that again, I get 13 out of 52. Let's multiply those two things together and I get 169. And of course we have the same denominator because that's our sample space for drawing two cards. And then I can again, divide that. I think I already know what I'm gonna get. Yep, 0 0.0625, which Reduce, let's see, when I turn that into a percent one, two, that's going to be 6.25%. So it's like less than 10% of the time. 10% would be one out of every 10. So this happens a, uh, a little bit less frequently than one out of every 10. And if I actually reduce 169 over 2704, it would be about one out of every um, 12 times, right? One out of every 16 times. What is it? One out of every 16 times, that's right. Okay, now um, what we have here is we have kind of two keywords happening. We have the word then and we have the word or. So let's see what we have. We have a 10, we have to draw a 10 first, then a jack, queen, or king. So they're actually telling us what we need to draw first. We need to draw a 10 first. So let's think about how many of those we have. We have four out of 52. And then, so then means to multiply jack, queen, or king. Then I have all of these together. So that means I'm going to add up all of those possibilities. Well, instead of actually doing all of those out, I can just add them all together. Four jacks, four queens, four kings. That is four, four, and four. That is 12. So I have a 452 chance of getting a 10 and a 1252 chance of getting a jack, queen, or king. So let's just multiply those together. 
that would give us 48 over 2704, which gives us point zero one seven seven. Move that over twice. That's about 1.77%, about 1.8%. So over 1% of the time, right? 1% being one out of every 100. All right, a little bit over one out of every 100 times is gonna be the approximate uh, amount of time that I'll pick a 10 and then a jack, queen, or king. This gives us an idea how to pick multiple events in a row. The key word here is then. That tells us to multiply to find what we call our compound probability. Um, now we get to talk about compound probability, but we talk about what if we don't replace that thing? What if I pick a card and I keep it in my hand? Does the probability now change? Does that affect what my next pick of the cards will be? Let's take a look at the ping pong ball example again. Let's take a look at our sample space for two draws. So this time, once I pick a ping pong ball, we are not putting it back. Okay, I'm going to put here, no replacement means to keep it. All right, we're not replacing it. So I'm going to keep it. I'm not going to put it back. Find the total number of possibilities from two draws. Well, let's see what we have here. We have two different reds to start, a green, and a blue. Now, if I do pick a red one to start and I keep it in my hand, is it possible to pick it again? No, because I have it in my hand and I can't put it back. So now there's only three options to pick from. The other red one, the green, or the blue. blue. Or conversely, if I pick this other red one to start, I can still pick a red one. It would just be the other red one, the green, or the blue. If I pick a green one to start, I can still pick either red. I can no longer pick the green because I have it in my hand, or the blue. So we can see how the sample space for this second row changes according to what I pick first. Once I pick it, I can't pick it again because I am keeping it. So therefore, I only have four options to start, followed by three options. If I multiply those together, that gives me 12 options. Right, and I actually, actually count those out. If you think about actually going down the street diagram, one would be both reds in that order a red and the green, a red and a blue. Or remember that there are two reds to start, so I could have picked the other red first, green and blue, right? And you can see here that we can just count up all those possibilities and we get 12. So find the probability of picking a red two times in a row. Well, look, since we already have the tree diagram, look at the tree diagram. How many of those are red two times in a row? A red, then a red. There's one, a red, then a red. There's two, everything else well, I can't pick two reds in a row if I start with a green or blue. So this is the only way in which to do it. I have one combination, two combinations. So that would be two out of 12, which is a one six chance, which is 0.16 repeating. You may see that number come up quite a bit, especially with dice, which is gonna be me 16.6% repeating, of course. And so that's just a way to um, set up our tree diagram and show, hey, if I take it, and I don't put it back, our probability actually changes. So instead of having a 4 16 chance before, a 25% chance of picking a red than a red before, if I keep it, my chances of picking two reds in a row actually decreases. Well, you can think about why, right? Like, harder to pick another red if I can't pick the one that's in my hand. So this is how we would um, calculate this without, uh, with replacement. So let's take a look at how we can expedite this process or how we can work much quicker. So we have the same thing, find the probability of picking red two times in a row, no replacement, but this time we're gonna use a shortcut. So instead of saying red two times in a row, we're gonna say a red, then red. So we're still using compound probability. No replacement means we're gonna keep the first one of whatever we have. So let's say the probability of picking a red, first of all, is a, let's see, we have two out of a total of four, but then we're still gonna multiply What's the probability of picking a red again? Now, I can't say two out of every four because there was a two fourths chance, but once I take one, how many reds are now remaining? Only one red is now remaining. And how many ping pong balls were in that bag for the second pull? Only three, because remember that I took and kept that first one out. So it went from a two fourths chance to a one third chance. And if I multiply those together, we have a two twelfths chance, which is exactly what we had on the last page with our tree diagram. So look at how the probability changed as we draw more. Because once I keep it, our sample space changes and the chance of me being successful changes. So let's find the probability of picking a red 
then a green. Well, a red is still a two-fourths chance to pick it first. Then a green. Well, if I pick a red and I keep it in my hands, how many ping pong balls are now remaining? Only three. How many of those are green? One. So the chances of me picking a red, then a green, is two-fourths times one-third, which is still two-twelfths. Same thing as what we had up here. It's going to be 16.6%. So the probability of me picking a red than a green is actually the same as me picking a red than a red, which is different than what we talked about in that last problem. Notice how the sample space changes on my second pick because we've removed one. And then we have to think about what's remaining. Okay, and if I pick a red, there's only one red remaining, but if I pick a red, I still have all my greens remaining. Still multiplying because of the word then. Um, great. So that's kind of how we would do theoretical probability with multiplying several events in a row. Now we could do that same thing with cards, uh, with dice, et cetera, et cetera. But what you need to know is compound probability means that we're multiplying. Now this, then this, let's multiply those probabilities. Now the other type of probability that we encountered was something called experimental probability. Experimental probability is actually observable. So this is something you should put in your notes. Experimental probability is found by repeating an experiment and observing the outcomes. So this is like after something has already happened, we can go back and kind of crunch the numbers. Theoretical was used to make predictions in a perfect world where experimental is kind of like, hey, we did this, we tried it, here's what has happened. We will kind of think about, you know, if I flip a coin a hundred times, it might land heads 50 times and tails 50 times. Probably not though. So that 50-50 chance theoretically would work, but we know that it's a little bit different than that in the real world. So we could flip a coin 100 times, then crunch the numbers. That would be the experimental probability. So um, a coin is tossed 100 times, a head is recorded sometimes, and a tail is three times. So somebody ran an experiment. This is definitely possible, right? Flip a coin 10 times, you could get heads more than tails. It just happens. And so what we would say here is the probability of flipping a head is seven tenths, right? Seven out of 10 times and tails is three out of 10 times. So 10 is no longer the number of possibilities heads tails. It is now talking about the number of outcomes or trials. Sorry, outcomes was a bad word. Outcomes was a really bad word. We could call that the trials or tries, right? How many times that we tried something. So with 10 flips, how many of them were um, seven? We could still call this like the number of successes for whatever we're talking about, which in this case would be like heads. All right, let's take a look at this um, spinner over here. We have blue, yellow, a color called cyan, red and purple. And you might think that each one of these, since there are five, that you have a one fifth chance for each one of these, right? That would be our theoretical probability. And we would expect these numbers on the right side to be nearly even. But we know that if we spin this, you know, sometimes it'll land more on something else than another. It's not because it's a bad spinner, but just because sometimes that's what happens with probability. What was the experimental probability of the spinner landing on yellow? So remember, we're not talking about a perfect world, one fifth chance. We're talking about experimental. So what can we actually observe that happened here? So the first thing that we have to do is figure out how many trials did they run? We see how many they counted. Well, 4 and 11 is 15 plus 12 is 27. Um, yep, 20, sorry, 27. And then 36 plus four is 40. So I believe we have 40 different trials in there. Let me just double check on my calculator. My brain kind of goes dead when I record a video and I have to um, do mental math in front of people that uh, even though I can't see you, as I can guess myself, of course it's 40. Okay, so this time our denominator is going to be 40. And you might be thinking, well, there's only five sides there. But remember with the experimental, we're talking about how many different trials or tries do we have? We had 40 different tries. And now we're just gonna count how many of them landed on yellow. Well, we can count here, that's 11. So our experimental probability here would be 11 over 40, which we can divide to be 0.275 which is gonna be about 27.5% of the time. So a little over one fourth, which is a little bit higher than maybe we would expect if we ran our theoretical probability numbers. Well, what about the experimental probability of red? 
Now we can still use the same denominator because there was still 40 flips or turns or spins, but how many of those were red? Nine. And we can do that same kind of division here, nine divided by 40, and we get 0.225, which is gonna be 22.5%. So hopefully that gives us a smaller decimal. It does because we had less reds than yellows. So ideally, perfect world, theoretical probability would be the same, right? It's a one fifth chance for each one of these. But if we run an experimental probability and observe, we see that they came up a different amount of the time. It didn't mean that one was any more likely than the other, but this is just how probability works, that if we run an experiment, we can expect it not to be perfect. And this is kind of the difference between experimental and theoretical probability. Now, what we're gonna do in the next um, video is actually run a simulation. So what I'm gonna do is actually flip a coin a thousand times, speed it up, or roll a dice a thousand times, or a hundred times, and see um, what we can predict, what happened, and actually compare the theoretical expected values with the um, observed experimental values. So theoretical versus experimental, we can run a simulation to actually compare and see what happens over time. And if those two numbers are similar, are they different? Are they very different? Are they very similar? And what happens if we run it many, many, many times? So tune back in to check a simulation and test some theories. Thanks.